Hey, this is CND Channel. I'm Chris. This is MMA for you. I'm going to be doing my post round analysis for UFC Fight Night 58. Overall, it's an okay card. Um, I mean, there's some cool finishes. Some of the other fights, um, actually, most of the fights are pretty good. There's a grinder here and there. Um, but otherwise, I, I thought it was a pretty good card. My picks weren't too bad. I got eight out of twelve. Ones I missed was, was Vito Miranda versus Jake Collier. Lando Issa versus y Yuta Sasaki, Hakun Diaz versus Darren Elkins, and Rashid Magomedov versus Elias Silverio. Uh, bonuses are four performance of the night bonuses. It wasn't a fight of the night. Um, Lero Machida, Henan Barrera, Vitor Miranda, and Eric Silva all got performance of the night. Um, one of the biggest stories to come out of this card is that Quentin Rampage Jackson has uh, re-signed with the UFC. However, uh, Bellator, was it, uh, Bellator Scott Coker has stated on Twitter that he feels that Jackson is still signed to Bellator. Um... There was a, apparently what Jackson is claiming is that there's a clause in his contract that says if they don't, if Bellator breaches their contract in any way, that Rampage has a time frame until he can actually terminate his own contract uh, with Bellator. That's the gist of it. I'm probably, that obviously, that there's a lot more detail to go into that. But, um, yeah, you know, it's a good signing in the sense that you got someone with name value. Um, I train at Rampage F Family Fitness. I have actually talked to Rampage. <laughs> he has actually helped me with, um, with a particular block to the, um, uh, cover roll. <laughs> He's, he, he actually was helping me with that one time. Cool guy. Uh, really cool guy. Um, so it, it's good to hear. If he is back in the UFC, good for him. He's going to make the most money he can through MMA in the UFC. There's always fun fights for him, too. Um, you know, a fight with Shogun, Lil Nog, Dan Henderson again, if you want to go that way. Um... If you want to give him some of these up and comers like an OSP or Jimmy Manoa, I mean, could do that too. So, but he's definitely got a lot of name value. Um, so, uh, let's just get started. Uh, Leota Machida defeated CB Dalloway by TKO in the first round. Um, actually, with this fight, I believe there's a stat here that CB Dalloway landed no strikes. <laughs> in this, this is like the one, the either the first or the second main event in UFC history where one fighter did not land any strikes, apparently. And this was one of them. Um, not much to say here, you know. It's just Leon Machida lands his, you know, flush body kick that he seemed to hit like the rib slash liver area. It was right below C.B. Dalloway's elbow. You know, it looked like it would it would be defended just with where his arm is placed. But uh, Machida is a sniper. What can you say? Um, now there's something to be said about hindsight, I guess. Here, you know, uh, I liked when I saw the C.B. Dalloway coming into the Machida fight. I picked him to beat Carmon. I thought he should have got the win over Boch. You can tell that he was a guy that was really putting together everything. His wrestling, his grappling, his striking was finally coming along. He looked like a top 10 guy. And he probably still is a top 10 guy. I think he's number 10. I don't know if he's going to get dropped out of the top 10 because of this. But like he looked like a guy that had a top 10 skill set. In hindsight, though, it wasn't a bad match on paper. I mean, Machi was expected to win, but... There was upset potential with Dalloway. He's a good fighter. You know, like I said, he's a, he's a solid fighter. Top 10 skill set, in my opinion. The thing is, though, um, 
You know, the last guy he fought was Francis Carmon, and then he got to Lyoto Machida. That's a pretty big jump. You know, there were guys in between there, like um, Telus Lates, I thought was a good uh, option for Dalloway. Tim Kennedy, Michael Bisbang, uh, Musasi even, you know. There's a lot of guys that um, I thought Dalloway should maybe fight. Not top five, but more closer to top six through ten, you know, type of guys. It's not unusual, though, to see, I guess you can call Dalloway an up-and-comer, just break into the top ten and get his first top ten fight, whoever it is. Former champion, number two guy, number three guy, it doesn't matter. You know, you got that big fight, and it's a main event. Um... So it's not unusual to see that with up-and-comers that, that are, you know, doing pretty well. But, uh, yeah, you know, just in hindsight, you can just say it's way too much too soon for Dalloway at this point. He just wasn't ready for someone the level of Machida. I don't know if he ever will be, but, um, you know, man, if you're going to get your entry to the top ten fight, Man, you know, Machida's like the toughest guy to get, you know? I mean, th there are so many other guys that are better entry to, to, to like, that elite, you know, that one elite win type guy. I, maybe not entry to the top ten, because I think Dolly is, like, top ten. But, like, that entry into that upper echelon where you're, like, really contending for the title... Uh, man, Machida is the guy you'd probably want to avoid, but the fact of the matter is, the middleweight top 10, really good. I mean, okay, you don't get Machida, you get, okay, get Jacare, you get Luke Rockhold, get Yoel Romero, you know? Even guys that are like 6 through 10, whether it's, I think Musashi's around there, Kennedy, Bisbing even, is pretty tall. Well, at this point, I don't know. How well uh, I think Dalloway do, could do pretty well against Bisbing actually, but um, you know, tough fight to, to uh, you know get that first like big name main event uh, for Dalloway. Um, and she just actually said he wanted to fight Luke Rockhold next. I think that's a great fight. It makes perfect sense. You know, if Rockhold wins, give him a title shot. If Machida wins, maybe give him a title shot. It's not out of the question. Or else you can get the win of Romero versus uh, Jacare the title shot. Um, you know, uh, Machida fighting Chris Weidman again. I, I mean, from what I read, I think a lot of people actually aren't against it. I mean, he he was already behind on the scorecards, but you know that that rally in the fourth and fifth round, I think endeared people to the idea of like, hey. Maybe if Machida changes things up in the first round and the set, you know, the earlier rounds, maybe he can beat Weidman. At least he managed to get like do relatively well against him. Um, so it's not out of the question that Machida could get another shot at Weidman. Um, as far as CB Dolly goes, uh, Tim Kennedy would actually, or Tim Kennedy or Bisping would be good. I know Leites is fighting Bosch. I'd like to see Leites Dalloway because they're both on the same tra trajectory. And also, their common opponent that they beat uh, was Francis Carmon. So, I mean, they kind of, they're kind of in that same trajectory. Um, and you get the ladies on Musasi versus Hendo. That works as well. So yeah, um, but yeah, Machida, I think Rockhold's the best option. I mean, if you want to give him someone else, the win of Romero versus uh, Jacare would work as well. Next shot, I thought Henry Burrell defeated Mitch Gagnon by arm triangle choke in the third round. You know, this is an interesting fight just because it's there's a case of Gagnon overperforming, and that guy is an underrated fighter. I, I don't, if you ever hear me, Talk about predictions with Gang Yon. Uh, prediction videos involving Gang Yon. I'm pretty high on it. I've always been pretty high on this guy. He's huge for a weight class, dude. He's just a thick dude. Really strong guy. 
Well, he's hitting some really good uppercuts um, on Burrell. Couldn't take him down. Still saw that uh, impeccable takedown defense from Hen Burrell. But, you know, Burrell's getting tagged a lot more than I had uh, liked him to. He didn't utilize the jab as well as I liked him to. He was utilizing it, but just not as well as I, I like him to. Because that's one of his better range finding weapons. Uh, he was kind of like whiffing some punches too, so that wasn't really something, um, it wasn't a good look for Burrell. I mean, he looked good overall, but like the way he was getting tagged, um, you know, I, I don't think we saw the guy that was running through the division. I still think he's a top fighter. But, like, he's not a guy that I can see beat, like, Dillashaw or Cruz at this point in time. Um, seemed a bit hesitant. I, I guess that's a word. Uh, couldn't really uh, pinpoint it. It's just, he it wasn't all there. It's mainly in the striking, though. It's, his grappling was fine. His takedown defense was superb. His offensive takedown ability was actually pretty good. And then... You know, once he got the fight to the ground, you know, he got the hard triangle choke, you know. I mean, his grappling was fine. It's just, it's mainly just stand-up with Burrell. Next appropriate fight for Burrell would be Rafael Sanchez. Sanchez's the odd man out in the whole bantamweight title sweepstakes, especially with Dominic Cruz. Uh, it hasn't been announced, but, like, more extremely likely that, you know, Cruz is fighting Dillashaw. They just haven't announced it, which is really weird. Um, and and Sanchez is kind of the odd man out. Uh, other than that, yeah, I, I mean, you can go Burrell versus Yari Alcantara. That'd be a, I, that's a fight I've always wanted to see, because they both kind of broke into the WEC around the same time. Um, so that, I thought that would always be a cool fight as well. With Gagnon, um, he might be like that one guy that Faber fight. You know, like how Faber always fights like these dangerous up and comers. Like I can see Faber fighting them, <laughs> like just because even even come off a loss. Francisco Rivera was coming off a loss, you know. Um, so I can see him get get him. Gagnon versus Caceres works. Um. Throwing in some of the new guys like Aljamain Sterling, that works. Or Russell Doan, something like that. Uh, works as well for Gagnon. Um, it's probably five more top 10 guys. I know he, already, he lost to Caraway. Um, I don't know how he'd do in a rematch. He might do better in a rematch, though. So that would be a pretty cool fight. Returning Michael McDonald versus Gagnon would be pretty good as well. So it's not good options for Gagnon. He's, he's a super uh, he, he's a guy that has this totally under the radar but he's a big guy for the weight class really good submission gra you know really opportunistic uh, submission finder um, and he does hit hard that's the other thing too cardio's not so great though Next right off that, Patrick Cummins defeated Antonio Carlos Jr. by unanimous decision. So, uh, I read that Antonio Carlos Jr. is now cutting to middleweight uh, after this fight. Um, and light heavyweight just lost another prospect. Like, there are not many 20-year-olds. Patrick Cummins is like, what, 32 or something like that? And then uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. is like 24. So, um, you know, you have this like young 20, 20 year old uh, up and coming fighter at 205. Now he's going to go down to middleweight. So, you know, late heavyweight, he loses yet another prospect in the division that doesn't have many 20 year many fighters in their 20s. Um, do not exist in the light heavyweight division in the UFC. I mean, you got like Corey Anderson's probably the best prospect, and now you're going to lose Antonio Carlos Jr. Um, this fight, I kind of figured. I 
the way it played out is actually how I figured it would. Uh, Patrick Cummins, despite losing to Daniel Cormier, I've seen this guy fight, um, you know, outside the UFC before the Cormier fight. I knew he was always really good. I was like, hey, this guy's got a good wrestling background. He's got good wrestling, good ground and pound. Not the type of guy that's going to get caught in submissions. Really good base. And yeah, takedown, ground and pound uh, against Carlos Jr. You know, um, just kind of went rinse and repeat. Carlos Jr.'s best bet was going for those leg locks. But instead of trying to complete the leg lock, he should have probably scrambled back to his feet. Even when he's got went back to his feet, his striking just wasn't enough. He'd wing a haymaker, come into a duck under it, get the takedown. You know, it, it was just the yeah. You know, I I knew that Carlos Jr. He's one of the better prospects at light heavyweight. Just for one, there aren't many prospects in light heavyweight unless you go into like a uh, Russia, Dagas, the the Caucasus area, like the Samba guys. Um. There's a lot of light heavyweight prospects there uh, coming up right now, but in the UFC right now, uh, you know there aren't too many light heavyweight prospects. And the thing with Carlos Jr., I think he's only been fight training MMA for like one or two years. Uh, and so I, you know, when I, when his matchup with Cummins, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be a tough fight for him because I know Cummins is a really good wrestler. The type that can neutralize jujitsu you guys, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, too much too soon for Carlos Jr., uh, in my opinion. Uh, with Patrick Cummins, I think a good next fight for him would be Jan Blackwich. Because uh, Blackwich is coming out that win over Alir Latifi. Uh, with Carlos Jr., I mean, just some lower to mid tier uh, middleweights. You know, give me your Tom Watsons or Sam Alves or Dylan Andrews, those type of guys. He, he's still a developing prospect. Speaking of prospects, um, Rashid Magomedov defeated Elias Silverio by TK in the third round. Three seconds left in the round. Um. I picked Silverio thinking that he'd be able to take the fight to the ground. Um, he's big for the weight class, but at, like, really no time. He didn't really try too much to take it to the ground. And Magomedov was just the much better striker here. Silverio, you know, um, to his credit, tried to keep com competitive, but you can tell that this Magomedov just has way better skill. You know, he can find his kicks better, he can find, you know, um, find his range better, he picked his shots better. Uh, Mega Medov's gotta be in that, and I keep mentioning there's this tier of fighters that are coming up right now. Tony Ferguson, Al Iaquinta, I feel like Michael Chiesa there, um, Jorge Masvidal, Miles Jerry's kind of in that class. But he already reached up there. Um, and I think Rashid Magomedov should be within that class now. Um, he's a really good striker. He's got a Samba background. He's hard to take down as it is. Um, but yeah, I, I would go uh, Magomedov versus Iaquinta. Or the winner of Iaquinta versus Lozon. Maybe uh, Tony Ferguson. Or the winner of Danny Castillo versus Paul Felder. With Elias Silvera, get the loser of those fights. And get someone like a PR to Hallman or something like that. Um, but yeah, good friend from Magomedov. Or if, the, you know, one thing you can always do with Magomedov also is um, give him the winner T Bell versus Park. And, um, you know, if you can beat Jason T Bell, you deserve the top 10. But. Layson T Bell is just that guy, you know, that that one gatekeeper that was really good at manning the gates. So very you know, like I said, I I'm pretty high on him as a prospect, but uh you know, he's not bad at any one aspect of MMA. Um he was doing relatively well against Magomedov in the stand up. Um she wasn't as quick as him, just wasn't as good as him. 
but it was it's not like it, it is a big um it's not like it's weak stand up or anything so I think he's a good prospect um huge for the weight class um so maybe he can climb up the ladder but Magomedov at this point is a guy to really a prospect at light heavy or lightweight to really look out for Next one, I thought Eric Silva defeated Mike Rhodes by arm trying on the first round. Oh, man, this is an Eric Silva fight, you know? I mean, he wins. He wins in the first round against some, like, lower to mid-tier guy in spectacular fashion. That's what happens. Or else he goes up against, uh, like, some of the higher-level guys like Dong Hyun Kim, Matt Brown, John Fitch, and loses in spectacular fashion. <laughs> That's the thing with uh, Eric Silva. He just, you know, you know he can beat the mid-level guys. It's just, he hasn't been proven. And he looks like a guy that has the skill set to compete with those top guys. But, um, yeah, you know, it's just three, you know, three times he's tried against the top guys and three times he's lost. But then he just keeps beating these mid-level guys like pretty with relative ease, you know. Mike Rhodes is probably going to get cut from the UFC as his third loss in a row. Uh, he got finished in the first round. Tough fight to give him to. Um, I know that some were pretty high on him as a prospect. He is pretty much the definition of how to handle, of the wrong way to handle a prospect. I mean, it's just... He's not ready for the UFC. Then you give him George Sullivan, which doesn't seem like much. And then it turns out George Sullivan is like your Court McGee, Ryan LaFleur, Mike Pierce type. That like grinding blue collar, yeah, blue collar type of fighter. Lots of experience. That tough out type of guy. Then after that, you give him Robert Whitaker, who's a good prospect in his own right. And it's like, you know, uh, and probably a little farther along, has more f experience in the UFC than Mike Rhodes. And then after that, you give Mike Rhodes Eric Silva, and it, it's like, dude, this guy, like, blitzes the Mike Rhodeses. So, like, this is not how you handle a prospect. Um, I know you don't want to, you know, I, I, I know the arguments are like, with you know sinker, I know there's a sink or swim mentality, but you know, I think there's a proper way to build guys up and and an improper way to do so, nonetheless. Whether in the UFC or not, I mean, you can point to a lot of guys that are built up really well, you know, that have gradual progression. Some of the top guys, whether it's um, John Jones, even I mean, that guy just had a steady climb to the top, you know. Um, dude, you name a lot of guys that just have really steady climbs to the top, you know? Um, but yeah, so Red's probably cut. Eric Silva, I'd probably give him Hungu Lim next. I think that'd be a really cool fight. Um, that'd be a really fun fight, actually. Uh, both those guys are potent finishers, both have gas tank problems. Um,. Yeah, I would actually really like to see that. Next so fight, that Daniel Serafian defeated Antonio Dos Santos Jr. by TKO in the second round. Yeah, dislocated finger. What can you do? You can't really stop a fight, you know. And a fighter can't stop a fight in the middle of a fight. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It's really unfortunate because this fight actually was looking like it was headed towards like fight of the night. This looked like that fun. You know, brawling type, somewhat brawling type, uh, type of fight. Um, Serafian really needed this win, though. I mean, you know, he lost against like Kunimoto in his last fight. Kind of embarrassingly, too. You know, uh, he got his back taken, choked out. Um, against a guy he was greatly favored to win against. Uh, 185, he's probably better suited, I suppose, uh, 
the bigger the the problem is we've seen against like when he fought like Caesar Mutanch, uh, Ferreira, um, the size the size difference was apparent. You know, the guy got taken down early and often, and he got laid on um, by a guy that isn't like an NCAA Division One wrestler or anything like that. You know. Um, so we, we've seen a case of, I mean, Serbian's like big in a thick way for 185, but um, he's not very tall, and that's the thing. Uh, he, he's just one of the shorter guys in the division. Um, and we've seen those type of guys like Hector Lombard or Hosmar Pajares cut down. Um, even Nate Marquardt temporarily cut down. Uh, to Walterweight. And Seraphian did cut down to Walterweight with not much success. Um, but you know what? Maybe he can just be, you know, I don't consider him a prospect anymore. He's kind of old uh, to be a prospect at this point. Um, but he can definitely fulfill the role of fun action fighter. Uh, you know, like I said, this fight was actually looking to be a pretty fun fight up until the injury. Um, so yeah, just give him guys like, you know, keep him away from like a Derek Brunson or something like that. But you know, if you got like a Tom Watson or Sam Alvey or like a Dylan Andrews or like, um, this is like mid level. Um, it's like those guys that have a more propensity to keep the fight standing. Yeah, you know, I think you're having to have fun fights with those guys. Antonio Dos Santos Jr., um, I'd say the same. Like, I think he kind of fits the mold of fun action fighter at this point. Um, I would probably, yeah, you know, just, man, you know, use him to fulfill that role. Uh, next fight after that, and uh, it's on the prelims. Where Marcos Rogero de Lima defeated Igor Prokryak by TK in the first round. A lot of, some people are complaining that they uh, should have allowed a little more ground and pound, <laughs> you know, to really finish the fight, you know, put a, a stamp to the finish. I thought the salvage was fine. I mean, he dropped and followed up ground and pound. I think two shots actually landed clean uh, in the ground and pound. Um, I think Igor for cracks probably going to get cut. The guy is not the most winning fighter. I don't remember the last time he's actually won a fight. Um, hits hard. <laughs> There's not really much to his game, and you know, I, I his role in the UFC at this point is like bounce back fight for guys that they see something with, like Fei Zhao or something like that, or else feed him to some of these like a guy like the Lima who is an up-and-comer in um, light heavyweight. He's another prospect, actually, in light heavyweight. That isn't too bad. He's a fight. I believe he's actually cut to middleweight before, though. Um, I remember watching Marcos Rogero de Lima back in Strikeforce. They actually gave him one fight against in Strikeforce. It was, it, was, it was against Mike Kyle, though. And Mike Kyle, during that time, was actually pretty solid. Um, still is a solid fighter, you know? It's a little too much too soon for Rogero de Lima. But, um, he's a solid fighter. Mutai's really good. He hits really hard. Um, I'd have to see more of his grappling now. I just don't remember much about his grappling. But, um, you know, I know if he goes up against other strikers, uh, he can do pretty well. Um, I just, yeah, I can't imagine this huge ceiling on this, or this really high ceiling on him, or anything like that. I see a relatively low ceiling on him, but I think he's only 29, and like I said, there aren't many light heavyweights in their 20s. Even 29, 28, 29 year olds are kind of rare in the division. Um, he's still improving. I think he's moved to ATT, if I'm not mistaken, so it's a good, not a good fit for him. Um, yeah, just uh, for him, just more lower to mid tier guys in the division. Um, for Brokrak, he's probably got cut after this. 
Let me show that Hanato Canero defeated Tom Inimaki by rear naked choke. Man, there's a lot to like about Hanato Canero, man. I, I gotta say. And Tom Inimaki, three losses in a row. All three by submission. He lost to Backstrom by a Bulldog choke, right? Chess Skelly choked him out. And now Hinata Canero choked him out. Tom Nienimaki is probably going to be done with the... Uh, is probably going to get cut from the UFC. Um, there's a lot to like about Canero though, man. I, I saw footage of this guy. and I, His striking looks so much better now. Uh, his kicks look good. His punches are straight. He's a tall guy and he was actually using straight punches. I really liked what I saw from his striking. And this guy's ground game, man. If this guy takes your back, you're like done. Uh, so there's a lot to like about him. Um, I am very curious to see uh, his progression moving forward. I think he's a... I don't know if you'd call him a blue chip prospect, but um, man, his striking improvement has uh, really opened my eyes, actually. Um, definitely someone with good potential for sure. It's more lower to mid tier guys of featherweight for Carnero. So after that, Hakan Diaz defeated Darren Hawkins by unanimous decision. Um, man, did Hakan Diaz need this win? <laughs> he was another guy that looks like he's gonna get cut. Darren Hawkins, he is keeping a streak alive of. Win, loss, win, loss. Because previously he beat Lucas Martins. Lost against Hawkins Diaz. I liked what I saw from Hawkins Diaz. And this is actually kind of... This is the guy I really wanted to see when he came into UFC. He beat Yuri Alcantara. And I was pretty high on him. And then they, they gave him like... What? Like Nick Lentz. And then like Ricardo Lamas. And uh, he lost his fights, you know. And... Uh, I didn't pick him to beat Elkins. I should have. I was actually thinking of picking him. But, um... I, I went with the grinder. I thought he'd be able to grind Hawk and Diaz, but that wasn't the case. Diaz actually plays... can play Darren Elkins' game just as well, if not better. <laughs> um, and Diaz is striking is much better than Elkins as well. Get to see, you know, he works, at, he uh, trains at Novo now. He got to see that vaunted takedown defense. Um, you know, I didn't always, I didn't see it in his last two fights. You know, he got take, I think he got taken down by Lamas, and I know he got, he kept getting like just grinded against by uh, Nick Lance. But um, you know, he managed to get his own takedowns on Alkins. I think he passed his guard, um, outstruck him. What I really liked, wanted to see out of Hakan Diaz um, come to UFC. I know he was actually a pretty hyped prospect coming in. Uh, his uh, prospects, I guess, were a bit soured. This is a good win to build off of. You know, Darren Oxens is one of those tough out type of guys. Only. You know, there's, there's certain fighters that beat Darren Elkins, Jeremy Stevens, Chad Mendez, Hawkins Diaz, Charles Oliveira, right? Charles Oliveira, I think. You know, there's a certain level of fighter that can beat your Darren Elkins. And, uh, yeah, uh, Hawkins Diaz did that. You know, he beat him. Uh, tough to say who gets next, though, you know. Um, thinking who's coming off of a... I think you should get someone come off a win, not a loss. I mean, you can give him, like, Charles Olivier or something like that. that that's a pretty tough matchup. That would be a pretty cool matchup, though. Um, yeah. Jeez, who else? Um, Jeez, Cub, Frankie. <laughs> yeah, some guys are pretty high up there. Like, you know, you don't necessarily need to give him, like, Frankie Edgar or something like that. Um, you're Chess Skelly, actually. That wouldn't be too bad. Chess Skelly, Hakim Diaz, that'd be pretty cool. There's so many other prospects at Featherweight that I'm just like totally forgetting right now that Hakim Diaz can fight. With Alkins, Sloan be the gatekeeper, man. You know, that's 
It's kind of miserable now. He'll beat your Lucas Martins, lose to Hawkins Diaz. Um, but, you know, his grinding style, perfect gatekeeper type, really good chin. Let him get, you know, let him get some up and coming. Heck, get him a Hanato Carnero, you know what I mean? Uh, that wouldn't be a bad fight for him. Next fight after that, Leandro Issa defeated Yuta Sasaki by rear naked target in the second round. Man, did this, did this one surprise me. I think it surprised a lot of people. Gotta say, I was pretty high on Yuta Sasaki, you know, coming in. Uh, there's this, there's three... Japanese young Japanese prospects that came to UFC Kyoji Hiroguchi Michinori Tanaka and Yuta Sasaki and um, all of them look like Hiroguchi probably has the most potential I think he's pretty much top 10 at this point uh, skill wise but the other guys look like guys are headed to the top 10 you know um even though uh, Tanaka lost his last fight against Kanye Kang, but it was a close fight, you know. This fight, though, really exposed Sasaki's weaknesses, you know. Um, guys, no striking defense whatsoever. And I was really surprised how easily he's taken down and, and got his guard passed. Um, I think he's just a little too reckless, you know. He briefly tried to take the back from Issa. The thing with Issa is that he's a legit Brazilian dude to black belt himself. Um, and a legit grappler. I just didn't think he... I thought they'd cancel each other out. I didn't think he's the better of the two. And, and in the stand-up phases, I didn't think he'd get the better of Sasaki. But man, he was just tagging him left and right. Definitely soured me on... Um, Sasaki's prospects in the division. He's a little too reckless. Has too many defensive holes in his game. Issa, though, man. I mean, two-fight win streak. Um, you know, I don't think of him as much of a prospect, per se. But um, definitely a very solid fighter, you know. Stand-up's getting better. Uh, real threat on the ground. Um... Some more lower to mid tier guys at the division for both. Next fight, I thought Tim Means defeated Marshall Alexander Jr. by split decision. Joe just got it raw. That one judge who gave uh, Alexander Jr. Uh, the 29 28. I don't know what fight he was watching. Um, there's also a knee here that was like illegal, not legal, and the referee kind of just made up his own rules. <laughs> At this point, um, can I say though, Tim Means is uh, who he, you know. He can beat your Marshall Alexander Jr. He's kind of a gate. What do we call him a gatekeeper um, per se? But it's hard to really call him an up and comer at, at this point. But um, so there's really not much I can say about the fight. I expected Tim Means to win, and he did. Um, yeah, he just needs more mid mid level welterweights at this point. With Marcio Alexander Jr., um, geez, is he coming off? Yeah, it's Lyoto, right? Yeah, this guy's Lyoto. It's like a two fight losing streak. Um, I, I gotta say, man, Tim, getting Tim Means, so this guy fought Wally Alves and then Tim Means. It's pretty tough, man. <laughs> For like a, a, a like a new prospect to the you know to the UFC, those are two pretty tough fights. If they keep them, I hope they give them someone like someone a lot easier. If they keep him, <laughs> you know. And finally, Vitor Miranda defeated Jake Collier by uh, knockout, four minutes and fifty nine seconds in the first round. Didn't expect Vitor to win, you know. I mean, I know his standouts are really good. Um, I thought Collier would uh, overwhelm him, but that didn't happen. Uh, Vitor's like in his mid-30s. He's not much of a prospect. Maybe he can fill, fulfill the role of a fun action fighter. Um, he does have legitimately good stand-up, but... Um, 
Yeah, so that one I can really say with Collier. Uh, just want to lower to make you guys a division for him. So that's it for my post fight analysis for UFC Fight Night 58. If you have any comments, just leave them below. That's it for MMA for you. Thank you guys very much.